Eden Memorial Chapels understands Jewish funerals can take many forms. Some are very orthodox, while others are more conservative or of a reformed nature. There's no one better in New York or New Jersey. Go to EdenMemorial.com. Reverend A.R. Bernard, Rabbi Joseph Pachasnik, the Rev and the Rabbi. Talk Radio 77 WABC and the all-new WABCRadio.com. Welcome back. I'm Rabbi Joseph Potasnik. And I'm Reverend A.R. Bernard. Reverend, we are honored once again to have as a guest Jonathan Wachtel, Global Affairs Analyst, former Director of Communications for Ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley. Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us. Pleasure, gentlemen. So, thank you. I would say the, uh, the world owes Israel a thank you. Right, Jonathan? Look, uh, Sinwar uh, was one terrible dude. Um, I've heard him called uh, mini Hitler. Whatever you call him, he was a disruptor to the max, and he was out to make sure that the world would be in tumult as long as he could make it happen, as long as he was alive. And, uh, you know, this is not a fan of uh, certain Western ideology, that's for sure. He was an Islamist. Uh, he believed in, in what he stood for and was willing to contaminate as many minds and souls as he could on this journey of, frankly, evil. Mm. You Jonathan, think, is there... Go ahead, Rabbi. Go ahead. No, do you really think he cared about the Palestinians? I, mean, I given, do. I think... Yeah? I, I do. I mean, look, of course he cared about the Palestinians, but those Palestinians who towed the line and believed in his ideology and vision. And, you know, it's one thing to be a practice practitioner of, of the three Abrahamic re religions, but it's another to say that one religion should dominate over all the mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. and, and his strain, which is uh, just utterly Islamist, is what should be happening not just in Gaza, but, you know, Hamas, uh, is, is, its origins are the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. That's all right. about right. hard-line, really unforgiving, intolerable Islam. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What I was going to ask you, um, is is there another uh, example in history of Israel's, uh, compared to Israel's actions? You know, there are those who will point to Israel as being the aggressor. The other side says Israel is defending itself, but it seems determined to get at the root of, of this thing, almost cut off the head of the serpent. Uh, do we have other examples of a nation doing going this far? You know, it's hard to it's a very good question. It's hard to do a comparison like that. I mean, you have issues like the the way that uh, Russia's dealt with, uh, you know, movements down in the Caucasus region like the Chechnyas, uh, in which you had uh, an element of political Islam. Uh, and territorial integrity of the Russian Federation and, and other complicated things like that. Sometimes you do have these crossovers. But to have a situation in which you have a tiny nation, Israel's absolutely tiny, and it's, you know, it's smaller than the size of the state of New Jersey, and then to be taking incoming, literally, uh, from seven different sources uh, fed by the machinery of Iran, uh, and and other benefactors. I mean, it really is a standalone crazy uh, dynamic. Mm. Jonathan, it, it, I was going to Rev. No, I was just going to say, ask if that's why it's more Israel is more open to this kind of criticism uh, about its actions because it seems maybe setting precedent. Well, there's that, but also it's it's a numbers game. I mean, Israel, you know, size is tiny and its population is tiny. So it's one thing when you're, you know, in a sea uh, in which your numbers are large and, and you get the ear of, of the rest of the world. But certainly the Jewish population, you know, let alone Israel, is just a tiny fraction of one percent in the world in a, mm -hmm. in a sea of, you know, 50 plus close to 60 organization of Islamic conference countries, 20, mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost two dozen Arab countries. Uh, it's just by nature of what it is, a minority. And when you're a minority of minorities, your voice is hard to be heard in that massive sea. So let me understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah let me just follow. I guess the reason why I raise it is because, you, you know, I stand with the state of Israel, stand with the Jewish people, uh, may not agree, you know, with the tactics that some of the state may employ. 
But uh, I agree 100% that they have a right to defend themselves. But there are those who, you know, are critical of that right and critical of those actions. And so that's why I was curious to know how mm. you responded to that question. Rabbi? Yeah, Jonathan, when we hear that phrase, a right to defend itself, what does that really translate into? That you have the right when attacked to defend yourself, which I think belongs to any any country, but there's an implication there that you don't seem to have the right to go in aggressively and remove the evil. You can defend, but you can't attack. Am I wrong in that analysis? Yeah, that analysis is right. It gets it gets very complicated when it comes to the rest of the world because you also have, you know, from the inception of the you know, reestablishment of Israel as a homeland for the Jews, you've and and other na- nationalities. I mean, let's not forget that twenty percent of Israel's population happens to be Arab Israeli. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but you have a situation in which you have the United Nations in there, and not just the United Nations weighing in from New York, actually physically on the ground all over the Middle East and Mm -hmm. completely involved in the Gaza situation, completely involved in Lebanon, where we're seeing activity, involved in the Golan Heights, involved in Syria, active there on the ground, their own interests in terms of, uh, you know, lack of a better way of putting it, a cottage industry with their own needs of personnel needs and, and justification of missions. And often those have come into direct conflict with the, policies of Israel. So in defending itself, the country also has to fend off criticism from an organization that is by nature of its construct and by nature of what its missions are literally and on the ground, that that you have these areas in which you have conflict and sometimes emotions and justified perspectives get bent out of shape. It all gets very warped and, and, and very um, uh, not objective, very subjective in the way things play out. So this whole thing of defending oneself as a nation, Israel is held to an account that is just doubly, in fact, maybe even 10 times, maybe even more, more critical of the state. And that's reflected in the number of of resolutions within the Security Council, within the General Assembly, with, within the Human Rights Council, in which you have this disproportionality mm-hmm. that makes Israel seem like it's the size of, you know, seven-eighths of the world in terms of what's happening, when in fact it's just a tiny little corner of the world, but manages to eat up all the oxygen in the room because of the nature of that relationship and international perspectives on that relationship there- due to the U.N. Mm-hmm. And the relationship with the United States, I mean, you know, there is a bond between the two nations, and I don't know if Israel is being judged uh, independently of its relationship with the United States. What are your thoughts? I I think there is, look, there needs to be, of course, a clear distinction distinction where U.S. foreign policy and Israel foreign policy lie. They're two separate countries, and one can't be calling the shots of the Mm -hmm. other, period. Mm -hmm. We have... You know, we have a lot of areas in which there's a a lot of perspectives that are common and there are going to be frictions. That is a natural thing, just as just as much as we have differences between the United Kingdom and the United States um, that that, you know, create complications and perspectives. That's natural. And there shouldn't be this expectation that the United States will be lock and step with everything that the Netanyahu government does. Absolutely not. But what is a problem is when you have this attempt by some to have some sort of moral equivalency of the Israeli government's actions versus what Tehran's doing, for mm-hmm. example, well, or what's coming yeah. out of Hezbollah and, and how they're essentially exploiting Lebanese sovereignty, which doesn't exist, to attack a neighbor and then bring the incoming back at the Lebanese people overall. You know, there are real real fundamental problems here in which you have to delineate where a sovereign government stands and what the policy is. And when you you have rogue actors or, let's say, governments that that are promoting agendas that are disruptive and not conducive to working out peaceful outcomes, 
that's where the problem yeah. needs to be scrutinized. But, but you said Israel is being held to a higher standard. I, I, mean, I think I'm thinking. Uh, sorry, Rabbi, but I'm thinking about you know um, the Sudanese civil war, uh, Sudan in, in 2023. What continues to go on there, Darfur? Um, is the Israel being held to a higher standard than than some of these things that are going on in other parts of the world? The Middle East is such a passionate place. You know, uh, news, it's a news hub. It's a place where there's this congregation of media um, focus internationally. The Abrahamic religions, the Holy Land, the origins of so much of belief Mm. within the world. By nature of what it is, it's just going to draw that attention. The symbolism. Right. Add to that the other elements that I was talking about, the United Nations member states and the makeup of the United Nations, the personnel, the other elements of this, throwers of the Cold War. Look at how things are starting to play out again. It's, it's almost as if we've gone back to the Soviet-U.S. competition days uh, mm. in, in some quarters of what's happening. And, and that is because those alliances and divisions have maybe simmered down in some corners, but they're rearing their heads because of what's happening in the world and these pressures. Yeah. So historically, the Middle East has, has been a battleground of the Cold War. It sadly is taking on uh, an image of that uh, and certainly elements of it today. And, uh, you know, it can get worse. But uh, what we have going on right now is pretty darn terrible. You know, I was telling the Reverend the other day that no one talks about Sudan or very little attention is paid there. Uh, You see members of the black population decimated uh, and you don't. You don't see college students marching. You don't see articles being written. If they are, they're just minimal. The the second point I want to make is you talk about the alliance between America and Israel, and you can't dictate uh, to an ally what the ally should do in a number of circumstances. I remember the, was it the vice president, uh, Harris, who said, don't go into Rafa. I've seen the maps. Do not go into Rafa. And Sinwa was taken out in Rafa, mm. right? Mm. And the, Israel made a decision, we have to go in and remove this evil, and America saying, don't go in there. So you see a clear distinction between what's in your own best interest and what somebody else thinks is in your best interest. That's right. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, arguably, you know, there there's a whole politically expedient aspect to what you're talking about. We can get mm. into that, of course. But this is where you are going to see differences of opinion, and some of the opinions are pretty crappy. That's just Mm. what's going to happen. And, you know, you're going to weigh these opinions, and then a nation needs to act in a way Mm -hmm. that is good for its people, but also good morally. And Mm. we are in an election, (laughs) not only an election year, we're just a couple of weeks out on on, – arguably uh, the most important race that this country has faced. And uh, politics, unfortunately, has been a major calculation in how policy was uh, presented uh, throughout this crisis. And that is really unfortunate, because when politics kicks in, then you're getting away from the core uh, principles, the moral stand of a country right. of what the United States, for instance, is supposed to stand for. And essentially, I don't know how else to call it, selling out for the expediency of trying to win over so, things in terms of politi- what's politically expedient so, as opposed to what is morally the right thing. Don't go into Rafa is a political calculation, not a moral calculation. It, it, it is. I mean, let's not ignore that, you know, and we can't. It's just not the right thing to do morally, that many, many people have lost their lives in Gaza. The statistics are being fed in by the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which is, of course, an operation of Hamas, and and they do not delineate who's a combatant mm-hmm. versus who's a civilian. We don't know that, and the numbers are really questionable, and there'll be more coming out about that in the coming months, and there'll be a reality check in which there's been a lot of hyperbole that's happened. But the numbers have been really tragic, and the basic truth, though, is those numbers have been very tragic because this conflict 
was allowed to continue much longer than it needed to. And there is there is the argument had the IDF been able to operate in Rafa and not be uh, have its arms tied behind its back, this would have been resolved quicker mm -hmm. and there would have been less loss of life as opposed to the argument that was made by some that there would be some horror show bloodbath as a result of going into Rafa. And, you know, there's also the complication of what role did rogue actors connected to Egypt have to do with this, with these tunnels on mm -hmm. the border. Rafa's mm -hmm. right there. If you right. go there, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty ridiculous. Uh, the, the, the infrastructure that was there right on the border. And that, of course, has fueled this conflict and allowed things to be unchecked. The United Nations, through its relief agency, UNRWA, allowing all this stuff to be going on in terms of providing services to the Palestinian population and allowing Hamas not to have to handle that and allowing Hamas to instead work on how to destroy its neighbor and kill people. These are all factors in this. Yeah. I, I know it's a somewhat rhetorical question, I guess, because um, we, well, let's put it this way. Rabbi just raised the conspiracy theorist in me. And I am aware from certain points in history where an administration would say, American uh, government would say, you know, don't do this. But it was just the face of the conversation behind the scenes it was agreed upon between other entities that, you know, this is what's exactly what's going to take place. But we want to make sure we distance ourselves from those actions. Um, you've seen this, correct? Oh, history is filled with that. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking of what Stalin did with, with Hitler uh, in terms of working out an agreement and then paying the price because the Nazis then invaded uh, the Soviet Union, but trying to, you know, divide up the world and, and, and working out something, thinking that, that you know, Stalin think, thinking that he could collaborate with Hitler and, and work out some sort of path at the expense of nations in between these two countries, mm. Germany and, and, and Ru Russia, you know, Moscow. Uh, so, yes, history is filled with these types of compromises. Look at the Kurds. Oh, 60 million dispossessed people. Ten times larger, arguably close to, than the uh, Palestinian situation, the Israeli-Palestinian mm -hmm. conflict. That population completely messed up since since you had uh, their country divided up into, into portions going to Iran and Syria and Turkey. You know, it, 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 just a mess mm -hmm. and and unfair ultimately to millions of people who suffer with, within the borders of these countries in many cases, certainly within the Islamic Republic of Iran, which disproportionately targets them for imprisonment and killing and cr crackdowns and ensuring that they don't have self-representation mm -hmm. and, and, and a sense of self. And you so don't, you don't hear the UN. The filled with these things. Yeah, you don't hear the UN condemning the treatment or mistreatment of the Kurds. I don't hear resolutions one after the other as a, being done to Israel, you know, I was, uh, Tom Friedman, and I'm not a fan of Tom Friedman, talks about some kind of international peacekeeping force going into Gaza. How does that work out, Jonathan, historically? We've seen UN peacekeeping uh, forces that flee. Uh, we saw that in the north. Uh, we've seen it around the world. The minute you have an international peacekeeping force and people fire at them, they're gone. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we all we have to do is look at uh, Lebanon and right. the way that UNIFIL, mm -hmm. that that force that was supposed to, I mean, arguably they're part of the problem. Resolution seventeen oh one after the war in two thousand and six, Israel, you know, turned off the guns and, and the fighting against Hezbollah because there was an agreement that Hezbollah would not be active in the area where it is south of the Latani River in Lebanon. UNIFIL was created to, to oversee that, ensure that it never happened. And as a result, this problem just festered and got worse and worse and worse. And then you had the number of rockets and ballistic missiles piling up in South Lebanon, targeting Israel. Mm -hmm. And we've seen history play out the way it has. And by the way, things could get very bad still between uh, Hezbollah and Israel. I mean, it, you know, Israel certainly is using the momentum it's had. But it still can be bad. And instead of uh, 
speaking in one voice to try to contain this, uh, certainly from UNIFIL's perspective, uh, you know, a couple of UN peacekeepers in Lebanon have been injured because their posts are right next to Hezbollah infrastructure. The IDF informed them to move. They didn't move. And, and they're in the middle of the problem, actually, probably, arguably, in some areas. If you would talk to uh, IDF um, uh, leadership, they would probably say they're standing in the way and actually interfering in the pace of what the Israelis are trying to do there. Now, that said, you know, Israel going wanton violence inside Lebanon, uh, killing civilians is not what anybody wants to see, and it can't happen, and there needs to be targeted, uh, you know, uh, takeouts happening in Lebanon, and certainly the Lebanese people, you know, proud Lebanese people are not thrilled in the long run. You know, some may be happy to see the IDF taking out uh, Hezbollah, but they're not happy to see Israeli tanks and, and other arms and, and personnel in their country. So it gets very complicated, and these things have to play out, but have to play out in a way in which Israel certainly does have major responsibility to safeguard civilian populations and to try to defend itself in a way that really is reasonable and doesn't go outside the bounds of what is humanitarian law. So, but yeah, I was was just going to shift, but but. In relationship to the Jewish population, especially here in the United States, we're about two and a half weeks away from, you know, a major uh, election, to say the least. Uh, the direction of the nation, you know, uh, the tone of things. I'm I'm prayerful concerning the period between election day and inauguration, and what's going to happen, you know, regardless of who wins. But how do we understand um, the fact that, according to Pew Research? 64% of the Jewish of Jewish voters are or lean democrat and Jewish people you know are are a people who tend to lean in the direction of conservatism at least social conservatism um how do we understand such a large portion uh leaning in the direction of democrats you know i this is a very deep question, and I'm sure there are people who have analyzed, you know, the very question you're asking. My sense of it is that the tradition of, of, of the Jewish people is that they're well-learned people, not always. <laughs> you know, there are certainly many I've run into who are, who are really not well-educated. Um, but, but on a whole, education is a primary focus. Often what mm-hmm. happens when people become educated, they learn they, to be critical thinkers and take into consideration other arguments that are out there and, and play the field and see what's out there and pick and choose what works. Now, an example of where that belief system has come you know, into a, a, a dire end is if you look at those communities that were attacked on October 7th, Many of those very people who were killed or are being held in hostage, suffering in the tunnels right now, if they're still alive, were progressive Jews who believed in coexistence, who were having the Palestinians coming out of Gaza working their properties and trying to have exchange programs and cross-border positive things going on. And the terrible thing is the actions of the types of sinwar and that type of evil element that works against an effort at coexistence has blown that up and killed the mm. very things that these uh, progressive Jews in Israel, of all places, willing to accommodate the other side and listen to them and try to set up a, a, a coexistence where, where all that has unraveled. And, and here in the United States, for instance, you, you, of course, have a diaspora that is not living through what Israelis are going through now. And it, there's a disconnect. Unless you see it, unless you feel it, unless it directly affects you, it's hard to have the, the sympathies that would allow you to do it from the get-go. Uh, and, and, and generally, human nature is such that we, you know, we all read about a tornado somewhere in some corner of the United States and we're upset about it for a, for a fleeting second. But if you're on the ground and living through that, that's a whole mm. other picture. Yeah. And, and this is a similar type of thing. Now, the Jewish community 
in terms of numbers is so tiny that there you can't help but have a connection if you're a Jewish person to what's going on over there unless you're so opposed and and there are the you know the very influential uh, academicians like Noam Chomsky and those those that that position on on the on the conflict and and the history of the Jewish people they're a minority but they but they do have influence and and that's a whole other thing to talk about but I, I think what I'm trying to say is that you have a population, the majority of which tends to be quite educated and and discerning in terms of open to and receptive to other ideas. And as a result of that, you end up with uh, a, a less conservative position. Yeah. I think also, if you look back, uh, Jonathan, the vote for the Democrats within the Jewish community has been, I would say, Pavlonian over the years. Automatically, uh, it would tend towards Democrat. I I recall reading where you know members of the Jewish community were praising Roosevelt, great hero, during uh, you know that horrific period. And when you look deeper, he was not. Uh, he was not the great defender of the Jewish people. And yet there are those. Well, he's a Democrat. You know, we have to go with him. I think the concept of tikkun olam, the repair of the world, has come back to to really hurt us in the sense because it's been interpreted, help others and think less about yourself. And I see Mm. people who are so committed to what's going on around the world, but when it comes to Israel, and I'm talking about Jews, when it comes to Israel, there isn't that intensity, that emotional intensity, that care. So you see Jewish students marching against Israel, but not against what's happening to Sudan, Sudan, not against what's happening to the Kurds. You know, it's uh, it's really shameful. It, it is shameful. And, you know, there's an interesting study being done at, at Princeton University that's looking at attitudes of Gen Z uh, students. And the, uh, you know, just to uh, give you a shortcut of what it says, it says essentially conservatives living within the colleges and universities are used to critical thinking because they tend to be a minority on campus. And as a result of that, they're actually better rounded, according to the study that's being worked on, whereas progressives are in a groupthink mode, in they're the TikTok generation, mm-hmm. and and they're taking a position, and they're not seeing things from another perspective. And I know mm-hmm. we're not, you know, this is a drift away from the discussion about, you know, how American Jews feel about Israel and and how that's been playing out, but but that is another thing to take into consideration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so. Where do you see us going? I know you've been working on trying to create a more uh, civil spirit in discourse, but yet we're lacking that civility. I mean, we don't we don't just disagree with the other. We look to destroy the other, to denigrate the other. I mean, yeah, are so- we just naive in thinking we can bring more to the table in creating that new climate? I think it's possible, and I'll get into what I do day, you know, during the day when I'm not being a global affairs analyst. But um, I think I think it is possible for there to be a closing down of this horrible, uh, unbridled polarization that we're living through. And I really think that it, it takes good leadership, and certainly when it comes to social media. Uh, you need moderation as well, and you need to shut down the troublemakers. Give them a voice, but you can't let them dictate things. Hi, Tom Bodette here for Studio 6. If you use battery-powered tools, you know you got to keep them charged. Cordless saws are great until you run out of juice and then find yourself chewing through a 2 by 8 with a dull handsaw. Of course, people have to recharge, too. That's why I go to Studio 6 for extended stays. There's a kitchen, laundry, and coffee maker to get you ready for work. There's even plenty of outlets to charge those tools. Studio 6. Book now and stay a while.
Hablas español? Sprichst du Deutsch? Komm du noch? If you've heard that sound from Babbel before, I bet you do. Babbel is the science-backed language learning app that actually works. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by over 200 language experts, Babbel gets you on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. With over 16 million subscriptions sold and a 20-day money-back guarantee, just start speaking another language with Babbel. Right now, up to 55% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash Spotify podcast. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Spotify podcast. Rules and restrictions may apply. help o'reilly auto parts can help need advice we've got advice no matter what you need we have thousands of professional parts people doing their part to make sure you have it exceptional customer service just one part that makes o'reilly stand apart the professional parts people oh, 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 O'Reilly. auto parts since 1981 Unbound has connected people like you with families worldwide on their self-directed paths out of poverty. A brighter future is possible for these families when we all walk together. Sponsor a child today, and you'll help a family take the first steps on their path. Change their future in just one click. Start walking with your new friend today at unbound.org walk. Where faith matters. The Rev and the Rabbi. Talk Radio 77 WABC. You need to shut that down and you need to have the ability for people to listen to one another and actually figure out what is sensible and what is, as as you said, Rabbi, just knee-jerk reaction of just speaking a certain position and Mm -hmm. not opening your ears to things. And, 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 you know, we see that play out where politicians between, begin seeing that they're in peril. They begin to pander to what they see is happening with public perception on things. And if we can do that in such a way in which really the citizen is thinking about what the other side is saying, is introspecting, understanding, and leaders who are responsible rather than fanning the flames of discontent and polarization and enjoying feasting off of this dysfunction in society. If we can break that pattern, then we'll be a healthier nation. Then our decisions will be better. Then we can check politicians when they're pandering and and taking moves that may not be sensible for the rest of the country or may not be moral, literally not moral. When, when making judgment calls that affect millions of people. And, and so what I'm doing through the social platform hour that uh, my organization has created is giving municipal leaders, superintendents, uh, nonprofit leaders, private sector leaders, an opportunity to use a digital version of what their community is and engage, listen, give people a chance to speak, moderate it and give feedback on on what the majority sentiments are and why they came to that conclusion, but not for the sake of just espousing a majority position, but a majority position that has come about through deliberation and understanding the subject matter and coming out with something that seems rational for the community to move forward. Let me ask you a question, Jonathan, because we, you know, we, we, we've experienced, I, I will say that uh, to a degree, we've become intoxicated by the power of illusion to, to manipulate perceptions and beliefs and, and, and realities and, and create essentially an alternate sense of truth. Uh, we, 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 we see it by using media, social platforms, and even in, in the field of education. Do you think that we're going to recover from that or are we going to be so glued to that power that we, that we won't let it go? As long as we, it's one thing that we all know news media organizations by nature of them, you know, uh, trying to fill the needs and wants of their readers or viewers or whatever, they will 
of course, cater things in such a way. And that's going to happen. And as a person who digests the news, and I'm sure you you gentlemen do it too, you take your sources from a, a variety of publications mm-hmm. and, and channels because mm-hmm. you want to see what's going on there. Mm-hmm. A rational person looks at that. Who cares? A person who really is a, a, a person who really cares about their community and the world and, and, and are engaged. And we all know that that's not the majority of the population oftentimes, sadly. Um, but there's a core there that that does take that responsible role. And they are listening. And and the more who are listening to a variety of ideas and perspectives and distilling it and then espousing what makes sense, that's the better. And in some situations, there need to be leaders or what my company, Arco, has has created through the Our app uh, in giving communities an opportunity to run this by their community, all their stakeholders, and discern what's going on before they make a judgment call, pre-test ideas with certain groups within their community, get to the right pace, then make the decision, but don't rush to conclusions. Allow the process to work of people trying to figure out what makes sense. A good leader listens to his or her constituents and mm-hmm. really listens and has the moral fiber to stand up when 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 something's wrong, to stand and have the courage. You know, obviously in a political season and Congress members who have to switch and defend their positions every two years, that's a hard thing to defend and politics gets in and pandering for certain groups. But if you're in there and you're able to do the good fight and do the right thing and listen, I think we can fight back at this dysfunction of our country. So that shows that faith leaders, I think, have a major responsibility to confront that challenge. I mean, you know, people think in sound bites. They hear sound bites, they think in sound bites. And to go through this critical examination of an issue and then reach a conclusion rather than come to the conclusion, then perhaps look at, you know, some of the facts, um, that's what we're up against. Uh, so I think we do have to fight that because if we want civility, we have to show civility in how we treat one another. And I think faith communities have done a fairly good job. I mean, we have relations with one another where we speak regularly. We talk about issues, you know, we we can disagree, but we don't destroy the other. And that has to be emblematic of what we're trying to do in the nation. Rabbi, I have to ask you because when it comes, yeah, I'm sorry for Jonathan cutting you off, because now our pulpit comes into play and the power of that pulpit. It, it, we believe, is a God-given platform to speak into the hearts and minds of the people who come to hear us, but they don't come to hear uh, another lesson in politics. And yet we have to uh, express in some way how our faith uh, tradition applies to what's happening socially and, and politically. And, and that can be a challenge. Rabbi? You know, it is difficult. And I speak to some of the younger members of the clergy who are they're nervous because they're in a pulpit and they want to, you know, express a certain point of view, not necessarily endorsing candidates, but talking about an issue. And they're afraid, how is this going to play when people are so polarized? Um, Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them. We went through that. But I think at the end of the day, you have to be able to look in the mirror and say, this is who I am and what I'm doing is in the best interest of my community because we're not going to get very far if we just, you know, have these sound bites that uh, that don't address the issue properly. Uh, but it's a, it's hard, and certainly, look, we and we've been in the pulpit for a while, Rev, and we say what we want to say, and we know that if people disagree, they have the right to disagree, but they're not going to deter us from saying what we think should be said, and we don't endorse candidates. Okay. Right. We talk about issues. What does our tradition say about the issue? And then apply it and give people some latitude there. But it is a challenge. And we as older clergy, well, you as older clergy, uh, (laughs) have a a responsibility. (laughs) You know, we have a responsibility to be mentors for younger people and to also show the community that we 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 have to do this. You know, the prophet prophetic voice has to be heard. and not not be intimidated by those who who want to diminish our role. 
and tolerance, and, and, tolerance is at the core of that, you know, within one's own congregation. And you, you two, you know, men of the cloth are able to talk to your congregants, and I'm sure you get an earful sometimes with, with uh, members of the congregation. Oh, no, never. We never. love with it. <laughs> you're going to get it. You're going to no. get it. But you're going to address, do. you're going to address, if, unless they're a lunatic, but you're going to address <laughs> what they're saying. If there's rational thought to yeah. what they're saying, you're going to accommodate it in your next sermon or whatever you're going to do, but you're going to do that. You're you're exactly the examples of what we need, and and doing away with this level of intolerance mm. and tribalism—that's the problem. Yeah, and yeah. this inability to open one's ears and eyes that there there are whole other ways of thinking, and there are ways that there are different ways to get to God, um, mm. but there's there are ways to get to God that are good for humanity overall that enrich in our pluralistic society and then there are ways to get to god that are just so narrow-minded and often misogynistic yeah. and all the other trimmings that are just awful and yeah. and need to be avoided and cause bloodshed and rift and that's where you had you know the movement of karl marx and you know religion the opioid of the people and mm-hmm. things like that there was an argument for that. That's why that became so popular because people right. got turned well, off by, by mm-hmm. all the discontent caused sometimes and fomented by religion. But if you bring that yeah. tolerance in together with that deeper understanding amongst your congregants, we're in heaven. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I think important for us to understand that unity is in diversity, not uniformity. Yeah. And until we grasp that and uh, and embrace it, you know, we're going to continue to be divided, and I'm going to try to, you know, uh, impose my way on you as the only way. Yeah. Jonathan Wachtel, always a pleasure to have you with us. You know, listening to you, I think people see someone who thinks through an issue deeply and then arrive, arrives at an opinion place, rather than someone who just goes there immediately without the, the thought process, the deliberation. So we're very privileged to have you. We look forward to having you again. That's Jonathan Wachtel, who's a global affairs analyst and the former director of communications for former ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.